This video will help you decide on when to sell your employee stock purchase plan shares. If you don't know who I am, my name is Chris Dime. I'm a certified financial planner out of Edmonds, Washington, and I specialize in working with folks to and through retirement. In my last video, we briefly covered the concept of an employee stock purchase plan, particularly a qualified employee stock purchase plan. So today I thought it'd be helpful to dive into the nuance between a qualifying and a disqualifying disposition of that stock. We'll cover the differences, we'll cover the tax ramifications behind these differences, we'll cover a couple of examples, and then we'll cover best practices. Let's jump in. So the nuanced differences, a qualifying disposition, I described it last time, but to keep it simple, that's when you hold the stock in your possession for at least a year, and you hold the stock for at least long enough for two years to have elapsed since the beginning of the offering period. To quickly refresh all of our terminology, there's some form of enrollment period, that's when you're allowed to throw your name in the hat saying, I'd like to be a part of this plan. There's some time frame for an offering period, quarterly, six months, a year. And that's how long your company will take deductions from your payroll to invest into the plan. And then there's a purchase date, which is the end of the offering period. And that's when your company takes all that money and buys the stock. Now, you may or may not have a look back provision. We'll talk more about that later. A disqualifying disposition is any disposition or sale of the stock that doesn't meet the prior two requirements we just listed. So for example, let's say you come into possession of the stock on Monday and you sell it all on Tuesday, that's gonna be considered a disqualifying disposition. It's not the end of the world. I have a number of clients that proactively do this. There's some reasons why and, and we'll cover those in this video. One caveat though, these are similar terminologies to how an incentive stock option is disposed of and the definitions of these types of dispositions are similar. They actually are different. So don't use these definitions and explanations for an employee stock purchase plan disposition in lieu of actually looking up an incentive stock options, disqualifying and qualifying disposition definitions. They're different, though they sound very similar. So let's jump into the tax ramifications behind either one of these two, which is probably gonna be a huge factor into ultimately deciding which one of these types of dispositions you aim to accomplish. To refresh our memory, you're gonna buy the stock for some amount of money and you're gonna get a discount. Then you're gonna sell the stock for some amount of money. Ideally, what you bought it for is lower than what you sold it for. Regardless of the disposition you actually fall into, qualifying versus disqualifying, a portion of the difference between what you bought it for and what you sold the stock for will be considered ordinary income and a portion will be considered capital gain. It may or may not be short-term versus long-term capital gain. Namely, if you held the stock for more than a year, it's gonna be considered long-term capital gains. And if you held the stock for less than a year, it'll be considered a short-term capital gain. To make this video as helpful as possible, let's assume your employee stock purchase plan has a discount and it has a look back provision. To refresh our memory on a look back provision, that's when you get the stock purchased by the company. They'll look back and say, which share price was higher? The share price at the beginning of the offering period when your company was starting to take your money, or was the share price lower on the purchase date at the end of the offering period? Nine times out of 10, the stock is gonna be at a lower price at the beginning of the offering period. And so your company will give you that lower price minus your discount as your purchase costs. If there is no look back provision, we'll cover that later in the video because it makes tax planning super simple. So let's say we have an employee stock purchase plan, you've got a 10% discount and there is a look back provision. To figure out how much of this total benefit that you made from when you bought it versus when you sold the stock, to figure out how much is ordinary income and how much is long-term capital gains, if it's a qualifying disposition, and again, you meet those two requirements, your company's gonna say, okay, we bought the stock at the offering period minus your 10% discount, that's what you paid. Then you sold the stock for some dollar value way up here. The dollar value of the discount they gave you, which was that 10%, that's gonna be taxed as ordinary income. Everything else is gonna be taxed at a long-term capital gain, which is 15%, which for most people who are an employee stock purchase plan participant is gonna be a lot smaller of a tax rate than ordinary income. So generally, if you're going for the most tax advantageous move, you're gonna to wanna to have a look back provision on your employee stock purchase plan and the discount that they give you, that's all you count as ordinary income. Everything else gets treated as long-term capital gain. If your company has a look back provision on their employee stock purchase plan, but you don't meet the qualifying disposition rules, so this would be considered a disqualifying disposition, your company will look at the stock price on the purchase date, as well as what you paid, 
and count all of that as ordinary income. And the rest will be considered either short-term or long-term capital gain, depending on how long you held the stock for. This is gonna cost you more in taxes generally, so to the extent you can avoid a disqualifying disposition when you have a look back provision, great, unless there's other parts of your financial plan that dictate a disqualifying disposition is in your best interest. Let's look at an example employee stock purchase plan for a company that's in town here called Unity Technologies. They have an employee stock purchase plan that does have a look back provision, and there's a 15% discount on that employee stock purchase plan. Their enrollment period, their offering period, as well as their purchase date are gonna be different than the example we go on to do, but just know that they have a six month offering period, so it serves as a helpful example. Let's say Andrew enrolls in the Unity Technologies employee stock purchase plan, and the offering period starts on January 1 and goes all the way until June 30th. The offering period is six months. Let's say the, at the beginning of the offering period, the share price was $100, and at the end of the offering period, AKA the purchase date, the share price is $150. So there's been a $50 gain in the stock in the six month period. From January through June, Andrew's been getting money taken out of his paycheck to go towards this employee stock purchase plan. And then in July, he'll have all that stock plop into his investment account. Now that the stock is in his investment account, let's say there's no blackout period on this employee stock purchase plan, he's allowed to do with the shares whatever he wants, whether that's do nothing and wait, or do something and sell it. Let's say Andrew wants to meet the requirements for a qualifying disposition. So those requirements would be two years from the beginning of the offering period, as well as one year since having possession of the stock. Two years from the beginning of the offering period would be January 1, 2024, and one year after holding the stock would be July 1st of 2023. So it sounds like Andrew kind of needs to bury his head in the sand until January of 2024 before looking to sell out any of this stock. Let's say Andrew waits, and now he sells the stock on January 2nd of 2024, so he for sure met all those requirements. Going back to how we calculated ordinary income versus long-term capital gains a second ago, for this calculation, let's assume the stock price on January 2nd of 2024 is $400. That start of offering period stock price was $100. Andrew got a 15% discount, which is $15 in this example. So $15 will need to be reported per share as ordinary income on Andrew's tax return for 2024. Everything above and beyond that $100 is gonna be considered long-term capital gains. Because again, he held the stock for longer than a year, so that's long-term capital gains. That long-term capital gains most likely would be taxed at a 15% rate. Uh, there are some caveats when you make too much money that that long-term capital gains rate is actually 20%, but odds are if you fall into that, it's still more advantageous than whatever ordinary income tax bracket you'd be in. Otherwise, your long-term capital gains rate wouldn't be 20%. So mathematically, it's pretty much always gonna make sense for somebody to want that 15% long-term capital gain more favorable rate than the ordinary income tax rate, whatever their ordinary income tax rate is. But let's say Andrew didn't wanna to wait to meet those qualifying disposition criteria, and he waited that one year after the stock hit his account to achieve long-term capital gains rates, but he didn't hold it for two years since the beginning of the offering period, which happens all the time and is probably the most common mistake I see. So unfortunately, it's a disqualifying disposition, but he held the stock for a year. How would that tax work? So Andrew's company is gonna go back and look at the initial offering date price, which was $100 in this example. He only spent $85 because they gave him a 15% discount. So that $85 is what he paid per share. Then the company is gonna look at the purchase date price, not the initial offering date price, but the purchase date price, which in this example we'll say is $150. They'll take 150 minus the $85 per share that Andrew spent, and they are going to make that his ordinary income liability. In this case, that'd be $65 per share. That purchase price of 150 all the way to the share price whenever he sells, which let's say it's worth $300 when he sells per share, that purchase price of 150 minus the 300, that's gonna be considered long-term capital gains, which in this example is 150. So $150 will be considered long-term capital gains, $65 per share is gonna be considered ordinary income taxable. Now let's say Andrew didn't wanna wait at all. The money comes right into his account on July 1 of 2022, and he wants to sell it immediately. He knows this will be a disqualifying disposition, but he doesn't care. He wants to sell out of it and diversify it because that's part of his financial plan. Again, there's absolutely nothing wrong with this. It could be in your best interest to do this. It's just called a disqualifying disposition, but I wouldn't let necessarily let that be the determining factor as to whether or not you should employ this strategy. 
Let's say the stock lands in his account and it's July 1st and the stock is worth $151. The purchase price was $150 and then that offering date price was $100. So again, Andrew bought it for $85. They have the look back provision and the look back provision lets him buy it when the share price was $100 at the beginning of the offering date. Then he takes the 15% discount, so he spent $85 per share. However, it's a disqualifying disposition, so now he has to use the purchase date price, which in this example is $150, minus what he paid, which was $85, so he still recognizes that same $65 per share of ordinary income liability. Then there's gonna be a short-term capital gain on the $150 purchase price minus the $151 fair market value share price that Andrew realizes when he sells the stock on July 1. So he'll have $65 per share of ordinary income tax and then $1 of short-term capital gains tax, which as of 2022, short-term capital gains is taxed at the same as ordinary income tax. So colloquially, a lot of people could refer to it as entirely being ordinary income taxable, which technically isn't true, but conceptually it's taxed very similarly. To break it all down, I would say the most important part of this whole thing to look at is how much of the total amount of money that you made will be considered ordinary income versus long-term or short-term capital gains. Obviously, qualifying disposition in this case, the only ordinary income tax liability is that $15 discount that Andrew got if he made it all the way to being a qualifying disposition. Whereas in the disqualifying disposition, regardless of whether it was long-term or short-term capital gains on the remainder, that ordinary income tax liability was $65 per share. Because again, the company doesn't look at the offering date, it looks at the purchase date if it's a disqualifying disposition. Now the good news is you only pay taxes when you make money. So either one of these strategies will hopefully be a profitable move for you. Just depending on your situation and your concentration of stock, that might dictate whether or not you'd wanna employ qualifying versus disqualifying dispositions. So I mentioned earlier, if your company doesn't have a look back provision, what's the cheat code? Well, it keeps it incredibly simple from a tax planning standpoint. Whether it's qualifying or disqualifying disposition, your ordinary income tax liability is the purchase price minus your discount. That's it. Whether you wait 10 years, five years, two years, whatever, your ordinary income tax liability is gonna be the exact same. The only difference in the equation here is how long you held the stock for. So theoretically, whether it's a disqualifying disposition or a qualifying disposition, if you wait one year after the stock lands in your account, you'll achieve long-term capital gains on the only part of the stock that you'd ever be able to control anyways. In this case, it's kind of irrelevant whether it's a qualifying or disqualifying disposition. This actually could be to your benefit because it, it removes some of the benefit of waiting two years from that initial offering price to make a decision with the stock. For example, Microsoft doesn't have a look back provision on their employee stock purchase plan and it makes deciding whether to keep the stock or not way easier. The tax consequences are so much more minimized that it helps make a more objective decision without worrying so much about all this tax nuance. So what are some best practices or calls to action? Well, if you have an employee stock purchase plan, obviously you'd wanna identify, is there a look back provision? What's the discount and what are my offering periods? The offering periods are gonna be helpful in dictating how much illiquidity you're gonna have for that period of time. For example, if the offering periods are quarterly, okay, maybe you can change your mind after a quarter or two if you need the money. If the offering periods are six months or longer, you're really gonna to wanna to make sure that you beef up your liquidity reserves in the event something catastrophic happens during that offering period, you can't call your company and ask for the money back. You just have to sit it out and wait. As always, I'd highly recommend creating a strategy for your employee stock purchase plan before initially investing or enrolling. That way you're less apt to make any sort of emotional decisions when the stock hits your account. Please know that there's a common bias out there that employees think that they can time the market with their employer stock better than anybody else out there in the marketplace. And although we all like to feel we have that control and we know our company so well, the math would show that employees of the company they're investing in are no better at predicting the performance of that company than other third parties. As always, I'm not a tax expert according to FINRA, so please speak with your qualified tax professionals since we did talk about some tax ramifications here. Speak with your financial planner as this does pertain to your overall diversification strategy. If you have more questions, drop them in the chat below, send me an email, we'll get you squared away. Have an awesome rest of your week. Talk to you later. Bye.